Welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and there's Charles W. Chuck Bryant, <laughs> and there's guest producer Noel, mm-hmm. who frankly, I think he's done enough times that we should just be like our other producer, Noel. Yeah. And then if we were in France, I would say our other producer, Noel. <laughs> So just removing the interim tag, the guest tag. I think he's. I think he's earned it, don't you? Yeah. What is with you and these snacks? <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. You should know Josh has a largish cup. This is not large. It's a small tumbler at best. A tumbler full of jelly beans and animal crackers, <laughs> as if you are a four-year-old. A uh, four-year-old should not be eating that <laughs> stuff. Weird. I don't like jelly beans, so. Well, whatever. Do you put them in your mouth at the same time? Is that the idea? Because they're all just mixed in there together. Yeah, I, I guess. I mean. Really? You're eating an animal cracker at the same time as a jelly bean? Oh, oh, no, no. Oh, okay. No, I see what you mean. I thought you meant the different flavors of jelly beans. Oh, gotcha. Are those the weird jelly beans that are like, hey, this is fart. This is <laughs> snake oil. Yeah. <laughs> They're not supposed to be, though. I think they turned. <laughs> yeah, it was supposed to be just lime and grape. <laughs> right. Snake oil. <laughs> That's a good good one. Uh, so I've been singing the Indigo Girls song in my head all day because of Watersheds. Just want to throw that out there. Is that one of their songs? I knew it was one of their restaurants. Yeah. I didn't know it was named after a song. Yeah, Up on the Watershed is how it goes. Yeah, it's a good restaurant. It's Emily from the Indigo Girls it was. I, I'm, I'm not sure if it still is, but yeah. I think it still is. Well, so she named Watershed after her song. Yes. But she named her song after the actual hydrological unit of watersheds. Yeah, I think she thought that naming a song um, Kid Fears would be weird. Oh, is that the song? <laughs> no. Watershed is the song, but I was just making a joke about another one of their songs. Oh, okay. I thought, maybe, oh, yeah. This is the most confusing (laughs) Indigo Girls conversation I've ever had. Including the famous uh, Indigo Girls conversation of Ought (laughs) 3. This is more confusing? This is the worst worst intro we've ever had in our lives. All right. Well, let's continue then. All right. So, Chuck. It's um, a watershed. Well, I already kind of gave it away a little bit by saying it's a hydrological unit. Yes. Okay. So a watershed is basically, actually it's even easier to say what's not a watershed. Whoa. Not a watershed is a ridgeline or a hilltop or a large body of water like a lake or an ocean or a bay. Wow. Everything else is basically a watershed. Yeah, which is to say a place where water sheds, <laughs> <laughs> rainwater, mm-hmm. water comes down upon the earth and then eventually finds its way to a larger body of water via watersheds. That's right. Uh, I just saw that there was this cool thing. I can't remember the exact name of it, but a thing that you can do here in Georgia where you can follow the water from Atlanta all the way to Sapelo Island. Oh, that's neat. Uh, And it's a tour. I think you like canoe part of it and you just sort of, you know, follow its path. It's like a little eco trip. Oh, I see. I thought you meant like online. No, no, no. You actually do it. Oh. You're oh. like, oh, forget it. Yeah. <laughs> no, it does sound pretty cool. Yeah, it's neat. I saw somewhere that um, one drop of water, this is on a kid's website, uh-huh. but one drop of water stays in a lake for about 100 years. Really? Before it moves along. Is that why you're eating the jelly beans and animal crackers? What? Oh, because I was on a kid's <laughs> website? Yeah. yeah. Nice. All right, so- we know what watersheds are and are not. Uh, if you want the strict definition from the EPA, they said it's any body of land that flows downhill into a waterway. Yeah, so they can be very big. Uh-huh. They can be very small. Mm-hmm. I saw somewhere that made reference to uh, something the size of a footprint could conceivably constitute a, a watershed. I saw that too. Right? Yeah. So basically anything that's defined by some sort of higher elevation um, that moves wa- that moves water on a downward slope yes. toward some sort of flowing water mm-hmm. that goes into a larger body of water, again, that's a watershed. You put these things together, 
And one little watershed that feeds water to a tiny little trickling stream Mm -hmm. that uh, leads to a larger stream that leads to a river, that's one little watershed. But it's a part of the larger watershed for that one big river that that little stream feeding it is just one of many streams feeding it. And each of those streams has its own little watershed. So it's a, a weird little patchwork quilt or jigsaw puzzle mm-hmm. that overlays any bit of land, Yeah, um, those are all watersheds. And when you put them all together, they all form one cohesive whole, and the boundaries are defined by elevation. Yeah. Because if you, as this article puts it, if you live on a, a ridge mm-hmm. uh, and your neighbor lives on the other side of a ridge, you live in two different watersheds. And your mortal enemies. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> if you're a Hatfield and you're a McCoy. Uh, the, the, our own article... Um, had a nice little analogy with the umbrellas. Mm-hmm. Like if you turn over, let's say five or six umbrellas at varying heights on top of one another, and they all had holes in, at the bottom, right? any water, let's say it started raining, it would just collect at various different parts of the umbrella and it would all flow down and eventually exit that bottom and maybe go into another umbrella. Right. But that would eventually, eventually get down to that main umbrella, which would be whatever main body of water it flows into. Right. So ocean or a lake or whatever. Yeah. And then each, each, uh, watershed is defined by the, um, the headwater of the water it goes into. Correct. Right. So, um, the, well, you have three things as far as flowing water goes, right? Mm-hmm. You got the headwater, yeah, where say like the river begins, yes, and snow melt and rain all flows downhill to this thing to form mm-hmm. the beginning of the river, and there it goes, there it's off. Yep, headwaters release, and then um, with that flowing water hits another f- uh, stream of some sort. You've got a confluence, yeah, those are confluence, uh-huh. and then. Um, where they end, say, like they go into a bay or something like that, a big river empties out, like the Mississippi yeah. empties into the Gulf of Mexico. Where it empties into the Gulf of Mexico, that's the mouth. That's right. And all of this water, it moves downhill or uphill. It moves toward the equator. The bulge in the earth attracts the water like crazy. Yeah, it can't move uphill, though, can it? Uh, to us, we would think it was uphill because we're looking down onto the southern hemisphere yeah for the southern hemisphere it'd be downhill to them it's yeah. just wacky <laughs> i will say though one time i was in a rainstorm in the desert that was so bad that there was water running uphill briefly wow and it was freaky looking i'll bet like it's just something your brain doesn't know how to process when you see a definite grade in the land and water going the way that it shouldn't be going. I don't know what caused it. Or maybe it was the drugs. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, it was an intense storm. And the desert storms, well, actually this leads right into this part nicely. Desert storms are amazing because of how the water runs off compared to what I was used to growing up in the southeast. But um, there are uh, a lot of different things that can happen to the water once it rains or once that snow melts, mm-hmm. it's not going to all end up in the mighty Mississippi or that ocean. Right. And here they are. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that can happen to it along the way. That's right. Uh, infiltration is one of the big ones. Uh, if the rain falls on the dry ground, obviously. Water's going to soak in, get in that soil, or infiltrate it. Uh, some of it will remain there in that shallow uh, layer. Um, and then that's going to move downhill through that soil still. Um, into, let's say, an aquifer or something. Okay. Yeah, that that's um, infiltration, right? Yeah, and sometimes it goes, it goes a long soil. way uh, or remains stored for a long period of time before it comes back to the surface. Sometimes it doesn't. Right. But it's just how much is infiltrating the ground. Yeah, and those um, underwater rivers are pretty interesting. You've got ones that are like in a karst system, like a limestone system, where it actually is like a river underground. It's amazing. Through like a cave. Yeah. But you also have underground rivers um, that aren't part of karst systems and that are actually rivers underneath rivers, right? So you have a river bed. Yeah. All of the sediment and soil and dirt and um, sand and gravel uh-huh. that make up a river bed 
is porous. Yeah. But it's also saturated, which is why there's a river on top of it. Right. But because that riverbed is porous, water actually flows through it as well. Yes. So that's one of the other ways that water can kind of flow invisibly to us underneath a river through the ground. Yeah, and, and that infiltration and how that water flows, it depends a lot on the soil characteristics, uh, whether or not it's clay or sandy, mm -hmm. uh, like you were saying. And then also, like you mentioned, it's just like a sponge, that soil saturation. Right. You know, it can only get so saturated, and then you get that lovely river. Right. Uh, and then, of course, the land cover has a big impact, too. Um, if you've got, you know, what humans have done is created a lot of, uh, they pave paradise and put up a parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> you not like that song? <laughs> really? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, you seem shy about admitting that. Oh, I don't like to put things down, you know? Oh, okay. You don't want to yuck a yum. Um, I do like that song, though. That's great. Uh, so anyway, what we've done is paved a lot of things, and then that creates what's called a fast lane for rainfall. And that is it's not the only reason why, but that's one of the big reasons why we have floods, is that this water that normally would take a more uh, lazy route and a more natural route. Yeah, water's super lazy. Um, if it hits that pavement and all, then you, you get water running much faster and in ways you maybe didn't predict. Yeah, the Geological Service calls impermeable surfaces a fast lane for rainwater. Storm Fast water, lane. right? Yeah. And it is true. And the built environment definitely alters the way water moves through it. Yeah. Um, so human, not just human uh, intervention or obstruction, but also human use, too. Like when we draw water out of an aquifer, yeah, that prevents it from ultimately going to its destination or delays it, I should say, depending on what we do with that water. Yeah. Like if we drink it tinkle it out into a stream, <laughs> we actually make it go there faster. Are you encouraging that? I, nothing wrong with that, man. <laughs> All right, well, let's take a quick break, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the other uh, things that can happen to water once it hits the ground. Chuck, postage rates have gone up again. Ugh. Which means trips to the post office, which already stink, are even worse now. It's going to be so crowded with people shouting and saying, look at these prices. Thanks to Stamps.com, however, you don't have to worry about it. That's right. Just use Stamps.com to automatically calculate and print and print the correct amount of postage for every letter or package you send. They're going to bring all the services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your fingertips because you can buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter, any package, any class of mail using your own computer and your own printer. Yeah, and Stamps.com makes it easy. They'll send you a digital scale that automatically calculates exact postage, and they'll even help you decide the best class of mail based on your needs. Plus, Stamps.com saves you money. How important is that? Super. That's right. They're going to give you postage discounts that you can't get at the post office, including three cents off Every first class stamp. Yeah, and right now you can use our offer code STUFF and get a four-week trial that includes postage and a digital scale. So don't wait. Go to stamps.com and click on the microphone at the top of the homepage. Type in S-T-U-F-F. -F. That's stamps.com. Enter STUFF and sign up today. With stamps.com, you'll never have to go to the post office again. <laughs> All right, so um, we teased everyone that other things can happen to water. It can turn into wine, <laughs> right? if you believe the Bible. It can <laughs> evaporate and then turn into rain, part of the rain cycle. Yeah, well, that's a big one. Um, did we do one on evaporation or just clouds? That's probably where we covered that. Clouds. One. Yeah. Clouds. Fluffy clouds or something. Little fluffy it. clouds, it's like a good the one. orb song. Uh, but when rainfall does uh, come down on the ground, a lot of it does go back up into the atmosphere through evaporation. And that depends on uh, how hot it is, the temperature, uh, wind, atmospheric pressure, a lot of other things. Right. Uh, then there's also transpiration. This is my favorite. Is it? Yeah. We'll take it away. Oh, well, basically, when you <laughs> uh, have plants, they're also taking in water themselves, uh -huh. putting it to good use, Yeah. breaking it down, creating chlorophyll, not borophyll, chlorophyll. <laughs> Uh, and um, 
Just generally making things pretty and happy. That's transpiration. Yeah, and that'll slow the runoff, obviously, because it's sure. taking a more circuitous route. Well, it locks it up, and yeah. then eventually it should evaporate from the water or from the plants and enter the rain cycle again. Yeah. And then, of course, other man-made things like water storage, like, you know, if you build a dam or something, you're literally in control of the release of that water. Yeah, that's a huge threat to the um, health and vitality of wetlands is dam building. Like, it helps us. Yeah. You know, we have um, basically a huge store of drinking water that we can create electricity from. But for the downstream ecosystems, dams are not good. Yeah. Plus, they can cause earthquakes, if you'll remember correctly. Uh, yes, that's right. I remember that. You remember? Uh-huh. Uh, so... H- hold on. I have to say, I was thinking the other day about those shorts for the uninitiated. We used to do one-minute shorts that appeared on the Science Channel. They were like the precursor to our um, actual show. Yes. Do you remember show. those shorts? Sure. Yeah, they were fun. So, the I thought of one the other day, though. Remember the one where we were playing racquetball? Uh-huh. That was, I think, the pinnacle of all of them. Uh, just the setup? Yeah, just the whole thing. Everything. went. It, it was just perfect. I just thought it was great. It just popped in my head the other day. I was like, I totally forgot we even did those things. And then I, I was thinking about it and thought it was hilarious. Yeah, the gag in that one was that I was wearing like a full like basketball uniform and sweatbands. <laughs> goggles. And goggles. And you were wearing like an Oxford and jeans. Right. And we were playing racquetball. Like, that how, was it. How funny is that? <laughs> yeah. I, I just thought it was great. Surprised it never took off. Well, it did. It got us a TV show. Yeah, that's true. We did like. It was the TV show that didn't take off. We had a couple of dozen of those shorts, right? Those mm-hmm. were all fun. Mm-hmm. I'm going to start posting some of those again. Well, this is my passive aggressive way of asking you to. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, watersheds are. Keeping them clean is a big deal. Uh, it really matters because there's a domino effect that can happen. Right. Um, when they're polluted. Oh, yeah. So water is great for transporting things, right? We put barges on them, jet skis on them, sailboats. Sure. It's also really good for transporting other stuff, like anything that's a pollutant is really easily moved along through water, right? Yes. And oh, the whole point of a watershed is moving water across land into larger bodies of water. Well, the stuff that's in the way of that water gets picked up and carried in along with it too, right? Yeah. So the pollutants that we just leave lying around, everything from dog poop to um, a- antifreeze ends up in the the water Yeah. because it's in the watershed, so it ends up in the body of water. Mm-hmm. And since we use these, the, these bodies of water for all sorts of different things, it's a big problem, and and it's a it's a it's something that I think more people need to be aware of. Because you think, yeah. yeah, I'll just leave my dog poop there on the ground. Right. You don't think about how it's going to rain and flush that dog poop in there. Yep. And create a uh, a coliform bacteria bloom. Yeah. That's going to kill a bunch of fish or give them salmonella. Yeah, I've seen certain cities on their storm drains have little signs that say things like you know. Just reminders, like, you know, what goes in this thing right. uh, will end up in, you know, some larger body of water right. and have a big impact. Yeah, that's good stuff. Uh, I found a thing that said the leading cause of pollution uh, are sediments and uh, a lot of times bacteria like E. coli. Right, from and dog e- poop. Yeah, and even excess nutrients can be bad. Yeah, because those form algae blooms, right? Yeah. So algae blooms are um, where a a type of algae is already present in a body of water. Yeah. But then all of a sudden, there's a bunch of agricultural runoff, say. So there's a huge introduction of nitrogen and phosphorus, which are fertilizers. Yeah. Well, algae is a plant, and algae blooms as a result. And they can block sunlight for other plants in the in the body of water. Um, when they die off, the bacteria that eats them and or decomposes them uses up tons of oxygen, so it chokes the life all, out of the fish that are in the body of water. Yeah. Um, it can make things quite smelly. Yeah. It's it's just not good for anybody. And and the reason why these algae blooms happen is because of the fertilizer runoff. Right. That's being introduced into the bodies of water. All right, well let's take another break and uh more more depressing news right after this. <laughs> Chuck. 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 Chuck.
All right, Charles. Where's the where's the silver lining here? Well, there, here's some more bad news. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was hoping to change that. <laughs> in the United States, 40 to 50% of our waters are impaired or threatened. Yeah. And impaired means that it doesn't support uh, one or more of its intended uses. Impaired means it's drunk. <laughs> it is. It's a drunk lake. Drunk with pollution. Yeah. Uh, so one or more of its intended uses could mean you can't swim in it, you can't drink it. Um, don't You know, it's always scary. It's like... Yeah, it's good fishing over there. Just don't eat them. Right. That's always like, oh wow. Yeah, that and, bad. But it, it could be it could be anything. It could be from there's high levels of mercury in there, to you know there's um, toxins, or um, I'm sorry, bacteria. Yeah. That could kill you. Flesh eating bacteria lives in bodies of water. Yeah. There's a lot of reasons and a lot of a lot of stuff you just take. Well, oh, well, that's the that's the natural state of that. Right. body of water that's absolutely not true yeah and like you know you're pointing out here that it's all it's all interconnected the EPA has a paper called sustaining healthy freshwater ecosystems and they really try to drive home the point that these are not isolated bodies of water right like it's it's all very much tightly linked to one another and uh, the human impact has this domino effect that you know you throw that cigarette out of your car and you don't think it's a big deal mm-hmm. that's going to end up either in a bird's nest or a body of water. <laughs> Just two places. Right. <laughs> Can't you see a little baby bird being like, what is that? Why did you bring that home? Just nuzzling up against <laughs> it, rubbing its little baby bird head. Uh where else? Uh, around the world this is obviously a big problem. It's not just the United States. Right. Uh in the Amazon basin, the Amazon River dolphin is threatened with extinction because of the domino effect of uh Watershed runoff, pollution. Well, you said it earlier. You said human, human activity, basically. Yeah. And it's not just us polluting. Like, say, you pour out your antifreeze and just go in, yuck into yourself about how great that was. Yeah, like kicking the antifreeze. I just changed over. my oil. I just dumped it down the storm drain. Yeah, you're not supposed to do that. That's not no, good, right? Not good. It, it goes beyond that. Like our activity, like say. Um, if you tear up some trees along a stream bed, yeah. well, tree roots have a really great effect of holding soil in place. Yeah. And without the roots to hold the soil in place as the stream passes by and maybe floods a little bit after a big rainfall, it takes a lot of sediment with it. Yeah. Well, you say, so long, riverbank, who cares? That sediment can go clog the gills of fish downstream yeah. and kill them. All because you just couldn't live with a tree in your backyard. Yeah, or because you just had to build your river house that you visit three times a year. <laughs> but even still, even if you did build that, you would want to keep a buffer of trees along yeah. the riverbank. Sure. Like there's just some steps you want to take, right? And it's it's easy to overlook a lot of the activity that we do um, that has these these negative effects on um, water bodies because we're doing them elsewhere but in the watershed that's still connected to the body of water. I don't know if we've driven that home enough yet, (laughs) that the activities we do on the watershed affect the bodies of water in the end. That's right. Uh, But uh, people are taking action. Um, The first Watershed Protection and Flood Prevention Act came about in 1954. That was a little bit more about coordinating uh, flood efforts, or flood prevention efforts, rather. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then in 1972, they added some more conservation efforts to that. And then in 1996, they, um, I think they made it friendlier to get loans for groups carrying out uh, measures that would uh, help promote watershed management. Sure. Financial loans. Yeah, and there's like a lot of ways that you can get involved. Um, the EPA is big time into putting you in touch with people who are already trying to protect your local watershed. Yeah. Um, there's stuff you can do if you're a loner. Um, if you have a leaky faucet, fix it. It yeah. wastes water. It also increases the potential for pollution. Yeah. That's one thing. What else can you do? You can fix that septic tank. Yeah, that too. That can increase pollution. The thing that's leaking poop out all over your yard. <laughs> right. Take care of it. Yeah, because it spreads disease, your fecal material. Uh, what else? Add plants and trees instead of removing them. Right. That's a good one. If you have a asphalt driveway... Tear it up and put down pavers. Now, what does that mean? Well, um, you know, pavers have uh, um, joints between the paver stones, so the water can trickle through them. 
Gotcha. It's a permeable surface rather than impermeable. You know what I kind of like are the, um, and this has got to be slightly better, is the, instead of the solid driveway, just the two strips where your tires go. Oh, yeah, that's Grandma's house right there. Yeah, and then having either the grass strip or pebbles or something in between. Yeah. It's kind of nice. Yeah. Or or, what about the the ever popular neglected strip of rocks with the grass growing up through them? <laughs> Which is what mine would end up looking like. Invariably. Or have you ever seen the ones where it's like a steep driveway, but they basically put tiny steps in the center of them that you walk up? I always thought that was ingenious. Love those. Totally love those. I went by, you know the, well, you may not know, but there's a street, what's the name of the street, leading up to our office, where there's a row of houses where the drive, the yard, it's like it's one of the steepest things I've ever seen. I mean, which, I mean, it looks which like direction a, are you coming from? Uh, going back up towards Glen Iris, there's a cut through street off of North, hmm. and uh, I mean it might as well be a cliff, but it's all covered in grass. <laughs> right. And I'm I'm just every time I pass it, I think, how in the world did they cut that? Oh yeah, the machete. I don't know. I'm just gonna hang out and wait next summer. <laughs> I think it's a good idea. Till someone goes to cut the grass. In the meantime, you should uh, clean up the watershed at that little grass cliff feeds oh man that runoff must be amazing yeah just flows like a waterfall you got anything else i don't okay well let's end this one huh sure if you want to know more about watersheds well go figure out where your watershed is and help clean it up yeah there's websites where you can do that type in your uh like find your watershed yeah that's one surf your watershed surf your watershed is the epa's one where they're more than happy to put you in touch with anybody who can help you figure out how to keep your watershed yeah they're like oh you want to help you the watershed great great did you mention the uh the watershed challenge no so uh every march 22nd there's a um world water monitoring challenge where you can get like a monitor a water monitoring thing and monitor the water quality of the water in your watershed. Yeah. Send in the results. There's a lot of stuff you can do. Anyway, go search all of that stuff. Uh, and in the meantime, it's time for listener mail. Uh, I'm going to call this Kitty Genevieve's follow-up. Uh, hey, guys. Recently listened to that episode and had a few observations. I've read much about the case before and have read Abe Rosenthal's 38 Witnesses account. It never occurred to me that I knew basically nothing about Miss Genevieve's other than how she died, like you guys were saying. Uh, you made that point and then made an effort to add some color in her life, uh, to her life. I appreciated that. Inspired me to watch the documentary, uh, The Witness, which you recommend. Mm -hmm. um, the documentary was heartrending. Knowing more about Miss Genevieve, seeing the footage of her dancing in the park with her friends made me really, really sad. Uh, but like Josh, I struggle to see any common understanding between Miss Genevieve's brother and Winston Mosley's son. Uh, though it was certainly a fascinating interaction to watch. Uh, honestly, though, the final scene with the screaming actress, remember we were talking about that? Yeah, man, that was... I thought it was going to be corny, and it ended up moving me. Mm -hmm. She was not moved. Oh, really? No, or uh, this is Chris. don't know if it's a lady or a dude. Could go either way. But uh, honestly, though, the final scene with the screaming actress left a very bitter taste in my mouth, left me feeling that a good documentary had been finished with a tasteless, hacky stunt that achieved nothing. Um... Yeah, I could see how it could be taken that way, I guess. Mm -hmm. So that is from Chris Downing in Sydney, Australia. Uh, P.S. I will balance my commendation of that episode. <laughs> uh -huh. I always love that. P.S. I'll balance my commendation above with the observation that Evil Knievel was not a man worthy of a double episode. But I forgave you immediately for that. Yeah, that was crazy. I remember like the look on her face faces when we decided to make it too yeah <laughs> we just couldn't believe it but we plowed ahead yeah i'll always say isaac newton got one evil can evil got two <laughs> says a lot about us yeah uh that's the way it worked out we still did one on isaac newton though get off our backs yeah maybe we'll do a part two one day on that okay even the score uh if you want to get in touch with us like chris did thanks by the way chris uh you can tweet to us i'm at josh um clark on twitter and you can also reach us at SYSK Podcast on Twitter. You can reach Chuck at Charles W. Chuck Bryant on Facebook or Stuff You Should Know on Facebook. You can send us an email to stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. And as always, join us at our home on the web, stuffyoushouldknow.com. 
For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com.